You like Wagner? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. <laughs> What's up, everybody? It's one fucking hour time. Actually, it's one One fucking fucking October time, time. y'all, because (laughs) this is, of course, going to be the first episode in our of our uh, October horror film series we have for the whole rest of the month. We're going to be hitting up those horror films, neck beards growing out, spreading out wide here. Um, (laughs) Yeah, a bad moon rising. (laughs) Fucking October. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, this is a yeah. bad moon. This is a blood moon film blood too. Moon. That blood moon uh, rising. Yeah, yeah that's true. Moon. Yeah, there's, it is. Yeah, there's definitely some nice blood moon energy in the movie. There is. Um, all right, <laughs> I'm Evan Husney, everybody, and of course we got to my left here, uh, uh, Big T, Tom Fitzgerald. Tom, what's going on, man? How you hey, doing, everybody? Uh, October once again. Uh, it happened so soon, and uh, here we are. Like it was like yesterday with I the know. last Tober. That's you know, right. Let's do one, it. One fucking Tober to the next. Um, and to my right, we also got Mr. Marcus Herring. Marcus, what's going on, man? What's up, everybody? I, I'm actually really glad to get done with the uh, the year thing that we are doing and get on to this more free form kind of thing. Although I guess we are doing horror movies. so. Um, yeah. But it does feel more free form to like not go yearly, yeah. you know, sure. year by year. Yeah. It, and it, leave- it did its thing. It ran its course, you know, but... Uh... I wouldn't want yeah. that to have permanently been a thing. Yeah. No, no it was fun. I'm just glad to kind of, you know, feel, I feel so liberated all of a sudden. Sure. Yeah. We don't have to, you know, rely on the viewers as much in terms of what they pick. We get to pick what we want. And, you know, <laughs> it's nice <laughs> to get back to that. No, I'm just messing. We love with you guys no, uh, know. voting for all the flicks and everything. But it's time to get into One Fucking Tober. That's right. We did this last year. So this is One Fucking Tober Part Two. All month long, we're going to be covering horror flicks. Um, and this is the first one, man, and we announced it last week. We're going to be getting into one fucking hour on Messiah of Evil, of course, uh, for episode 84 of the show. But before we do, guys, um, as we mentioned also last week, you guys got some pretty f- awesome shit happening uh, this month in o- October yourselves, right? Outside of the goddamn show. Isn't that right? That's right. We got a we got a live show coming up for our uh, Tom and Tom and I have a, a streaming channel called EXP TV. It's on exptv.org and on Twitch at exptv underscore. Hundreds of hours of obscure media and video clips, and uh, we're doing the live show here in in LA. Tom's cut some new mixes up, and uh, yeah. We're, and we're giving away buttons, so uh, come meet us Ooh, in person. Get you get a free button and you know, balloons and hot dogs for the kids. Well, not the balloons <laughs> and hot dogs, part, but... or the hot dogs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's Nothing's right. You free. guys, you guys are you guys are doing a residency for starting next week in October at the Philosophical Research Society, right? And next week is the first show. Um, yeah, yeah. This crazy the place from the '30s. It's on Los Feliz Boulevard uh, in Los Feliz uh, neighborhood. And uh, yeah, on uh, Tuesday is one of the first uh, of four mm-hmm. weeklies. We we've been doing monthlies. This is the first weekly because you know it's October. Why not Hell go yeah. go ham? So every Tuesday we're doing something <laughs> starting this next Tuesday. And so uh, yeah, we're showing. Uh, I'm doing a new mix. Uh, it's called Bizarre Encounters, <laughs> and it's about uh, psychic cats and Bigfoots from outer space and. When Bigfoot dies, um, <laughs> UFOs come down and pick up the bones, so there's no evidence. Like it's like wow. uh, 70 minutes of that crazy horse shit. It's a lot of fun. I, I already made the mix, and then uh, it's a double feature. And then after that, I actually had flown in a 16 millimeter print of this movie called Amazing World of Ghosts, Whoa. which is equally, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all the way from Australia. Uh, it's it's beyond rare. And uh, we're going to be rolling, yeah, the three reels of the 16 millimeter speculative uh, documentary that uh, it's really crazy. Some people think it's a it's a put on that it's a, a weird stealth parody because the narration is completely bonkers and 
none of it adds up and it's like it's like 90 minutes of crackpot theories and uh <laughs> it's really i mean but the, the audience is really funny too i just remember like the last time we watched it together i was like my sides were aching i was laughing so hard ah, you know? yeah um, it's it's kind of a comedy so yeah we're doing both those things a, a premiere of a exp great. mix and uh, awesome. a 60 millimeter of uh, amazing world of ghosts very fun so the 10th los angeles california los feliz neighborhood it's tuesday october 10th at the philosophical research society link in the description if you want to go hang out with tom and marcus uh for exp tv live man that's awesome um, and one other quick plug before we get to the main event, of course, is the One Fucking Hour Patreon, patreon.com slash one fucking hour. Uh, if you like what we do talking about movies and you want to hear us talk about even want to hear us talk more about movies, doing audio commentaries and bonus episodes. And if you want 24 hour early access to all of our shows, this is the best deal for you, man, because it also supports the show. Uh, it's just five bucks a month. Um, and you can also, if uh, you're also watching this on YouTube and you'd prefer to become a member, or as we call it, a moment of our YouTube channel, scroll underneath the video, click join, and you can do the same there. Also five bucks a month. Same perks, same shit. Thank you guys so much. Patreon.com slash one fucking hour. All right, you guys ready? Central perk. Yeah. <laughs> perk mania. Um, all right, you guys ready for uh, tonight's main event? Yeah, one October. Yeah. Clocktober. <laughs> All right, here we go. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna start it right now, and here we go. Yeah. All right. All right. Messiah of Evil, you guys. Um, here's you know this is now normally we always read a synopsis at the top of the show to fill the people in on the movie. This mm -hmm. I pulled from a Blu-ray release. Blu-ray uh, release mm -hmm. of the movie. Um, I think it's like a recent special edition, but. I was reading the synopsis and I was like, shit, I didn't catch half this shit they're talking about right. in the synopsis <laughs> at all. I, I, I'm getting a reminder of kind of a, a, a visitor kind of synopsis vibe. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know exactly. What I mean. Shout out to our episode on The Visitor. Uh, it's in the archives. Uh, but this is what I read and it sounds cool. So I'm going to go with it. But I didn't. I don't know if we saw the same movie. Um, but right. let's, <laughs> let me try. Okay, here we go. Here's the synopsis. 100 years ago... A demonic priest from hell passed through a seaside town carrying a blood-crazed contagion that reduced all good citizens to mindless cannibal zombies. Following a frenzied flesh-eating orgy, the dark priest walked straight into the sea, promising to return a century later to lead a new zombie apocalypse. This time around, the vile contagion precedes him. As spaced-out followers gather on the beach, awaiting their master's return, the town is already in the grip of a carnivorous epidemic of madness. When uh, innocent young Arletti comes to town searching for her missing father, she realizes too late that the demon priest of the Blood Moon is coming for her. <laughs> that's the that's the synopsis in the back of a DVD. Yes, wow. the Blu-ray. Someone insane. got a little carried away. That's with, like uh, um, let's get rid of the mystery and intrigue and just get straight to what it's about. I you know, know, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, it is. Kind well, but of it's like, also so much of of those plot points are very uh gingerly referenced in the right. film there is a, there's like one flashback briefly yeah. and it's kind of like not the best part of the movie and it's yeah. towards the end and it's poorly shot and it's very short and probably you have to watch um, it multiple times for that to sink in yeah you know, yeah it's yeah. like that's on. that's hardly the lead but it's yeah. also I mean, kind it, of like leading with like the answer to the mystery of a sherlock holmes story or something though you know <laughs> like uh, well, also, also this doesn't have this isn't exactly agatha christie uh <laughs> Ah, structure no, either, it, you know, it, like, it, so it's like what's the point almost like it, it does make it sound right. like some you know malaysian mondo macabro film you know yeah, it kind of gives a right. different flavor to it but it, this is yeah. you know look i mean when we talked about picking movies for one fucking tober and horror movies we really wanted to cover this was always on the short list because we're all big fans this is kind of uh, a very special movie in that um you know, it it is it, it has this like you know I always love a nightmare logic. If if any sort of seventies yeah. horror film has got that nightmare logic dream dream state thing going on, I'm I'm signed up for it. And this does too. It's incredibly delirious, got a lot of style, and something that I know we individually kind of checked out some of the audio commentaries on some of the releases of this movie. 
But the mm. fact that in which, you know, it kind of the, the filmmakers behind it delved into this, which we'll get into, is the idea that the influence of this, like, like the influences of this horror movie are much more art house than they are mm. genre. You know, these aren't, this isn't a horror film made by people who like horror films or wanted to they may have not even film. ever seen a horror film <laughs> yeah, right. and they they read right. about it you know they're right. like oh there's like a <laughs> zombie and like there's blood but like otherwise they're yeah. catching the godard and antonioni yes. double feature mm-hmm. yes. at the local art house that's that's what we're talking about here which is a, a sweet spot and one of my favorite uh it's oh. actually my favorite genre so it, it dude mm-hmm. it adds so much to the movie and, and listening to the the director commentary today and and hearing uh, Gloria Katz, who's the producer of the film, she also you know is pretty much the, the co-creative pilot of this movie. She yeah. she's commenting while seeing the movie back, which I'm guessing for the first time in many years. She's like, "Geez, watching this, it sounds like we watched La Ventura way too many times," <laughs> you know. <laughs> right, 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 right. And that's great to have a horror movie that's rooted in La Ventura. But you know? and, yeah. and and you know it's and then of compounding that, it's set in like. Uh, you know, California, like small town, uh, California, like not, you know, glorious Europe or something like that. So mm-hmm. that only adds to it for me. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I first saw this movie. Yeah, it's like this kind of confusing blend of this enigmatic story and it's like a low budget and it's artsy and there's horror and it just, it's like confusing to me. Like, where did this come from? But yeah, it's definitely one of those yeah. situations where when you learn the backstory, it's very illuminating. And then you kind of understand how a film yeah. like this comes to be. And totally. if I might, we were talking earlier just about like uh, what context this film is in. And, and what I mean is what we talked about was where it's art house meets grindhouse kind of, which, as I say, is my my sweet spot. And it's of amazing. course, that's post easy rider, more or less, more or less 69 to like 73, uh, partly because uh, stuff like this would get bankrolled because the people with the money were like, oh, God, let's take a chance on this dumbass or whatever you know, this USC student, because uh, maybe they'll have something. Yeah. So I'll just give you one other example. There are many, but there's this film, but then there's also Alan Rudolph, who you might know from Remember My Name. Shout, Shout out. out. Mm-hmm. In our right? archive. Uh, welcome to LA, Choose Me, uh, a bunch of the moderns, I think. So Alan Rudolph, you know, he was an aspiring filmmaker, and he had to make a genre film. He had to make a horror film to make any film, because mm-hmm. that was sort of the compromise. It's like, all right, you're some crazy freaked out art house wannabe you know college film student uh we'll we'll make a movie for we'll make your movie but you gotta like have blood and monsters and stuff so he made a movie called premonition in 1972 and it's not horror it's about a rock band on the skids and (laughs) they're having problems relating to each other and then there's suddenly this red flowers everywhere and it changes their personalities and wow. they get possessed. There's, but there's no like murders or anything. And it's like, a lot this. of dream logic and hallucination premonition. Yeah. So, uh, and there's more, I could do this all night, but like, uh, this is definitely firmly in that camp because just to keep going with this, it's like, uh, this film is actually made in 1971, which again is that two year sweet spot post easy rider where you could get some financing, yeah. Because everyone with money was like shrugging their shoulders like, I don't know, my long haired kid might like this crap. You know, that kind of <laughs> that's what we're talking about. Sure. You know, the BJ Lang period. So uh, <laughs> and, and it was uh, so 1971, because the thing that confused me was like it was it was cited as 1973, but then mostly it was like playing in 74. And I was always like, that feels things changed by 74. So um, this is a true uh part of the canon of the post easy rider horror film you know it's probably the best example yeah um absolutely and also one other thing too is that you know another thing that was really go popping off at this time is you know roger corman sort of taking all the new hollywood people you know Mm -hmm. right out of film school giving them jobs and a lot of them or the early the early jobs were rooted in exploitation films shout out to targets, which That's is right. one of our previous yeah. episodes. Peter Bogdanovich was uh, doing that. Yeah, Marcus. Right. Oh, just yeah. I mean, I totally agree. And these just learning about these, uh, you know, these directors and like just their associations. You know, like they knew Bogdanovich. They knew. You know, they worked with George Lucas. We'll get into this more, I'm sure. You know, they knew Francis Coppola. So they were, you know, who also had made that path 
to from you know dimension 13 or whatever being like a, a yeah. pathway into filmmaking you know mm -hmm. so i think like it's not only is it something that's happening like in the ether but they've got friends who have made this path yeah. before you know from making a horror movie a low budget horror movie that launches their directorial right like career, they could so. see that there's uh, uh breadcrumbs yeah to yeah. follow you know yeah yeah and then just like the, but then the same sort of uh influences too like i know uh coppola was really into like uh, antonioni as well and tried and this has tried to work elements of that into his films and so yeah. yeah that's that that's that sort of special brew that this movie has it's like Dude. dawn of new hollywood the path to success is a horror movie we all love euro art house movies you know and i yeah. think it's like yeah. that special brew is kind of explains like why this movie turned out the way it did yeah. well why, partially dude, yeah. why it looks and sounds this way Dude, yeah, the, the, yeah. And, why, and why the narrative, it's almost a, another fool's errand to like closely follow like a, a regimented narrative with this film because it's, <laughs> well, yeah. you know, Evan said the two big things for me, just the, the tent poles here, it's like dream slash nightmare logic, amen. But mm -hmm. then also what, what I've always really responded to is it's overstuffed with style. Yeah. You know? And that's mm. not always common. It's like nope. a bonus. And I've always said this. Yep. Even if you have no money, your movie could look dope. Yes. It could look cool. Yeah. It's just choices. Like, you yeah. could shoot people talking in front of a wall. Fuck mm -hmm. you. Who cares? Like a white wall. Or you could make the wall like yeah. a weird mural of sad people at a bus depot. Yeah. You know? And then <laughs> yeah. it's like, holy shit. It's like yeah, an exploding yeah. work of yeah. art, you know? If I yeah. can say, like, one thing that I've really discovered in the process of doing this show with you guys is that the movies that I like the most are by filmmakers who are taking the Antonioni ball and running with it. I know. <laughs> you know, it's like, a lot. It's like, dude, it's like Antonioni is the answer, yeah. man. Yeah, uh, it's true. Fucking more than crazy. Fellini, a lot more than Fellini. It's or anybody. Not, not, that, yeah. not to. Yeah. Or Bergman even. But yeah, you know? Antonioni run away with it as, as far dude. as a. a an influence yeah. on on cats that we dig yeah dude mm -hmm. so all right let's talk about these cats okay gloria cats um <laughs> and uh <laughs> willard help me out how do i say his hike. name w hike, willard hike. hike uh yeah hike, so hike 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 so um <laughs> They were working with George, uh, Marcus's favorite, on American Graffiti, uh, writing the treatments uh, for the script, uh, which would become, yeah. um, of course, American Graffiti. And um, George brought them under his wing, gave them the deal to, write, to start writing uh, the script for United Artists. But simultaneously, this sort of um, creative duo here, um, and they, they were married, we should say, as well, too, yeah. Willard and Gloria. Simultaneously, their agent had just quit uh, whatever agency he was at and became an independent producer and tracked some weirdos down in Texas who had some money to invest in a movie. And uh, but the only caveat really being it has to be a horror movie. So they agreed. Just like, like we oh, were saying, you know, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So it's like, okay, well, we get to make a movie. We don't know shit about horror movies. Um, it's also amazing to hear them in the commentary, like where the guy who's moderating is like, oh, have you seen X, Y, and Z horror movie? And they're like, nah, I've never seen it. Yeah. Like, they're like, Carnival of Souls? Yeah. Never seen it. Even Night though this of the is Living, like, what? Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> but this is like very Carnival of Souls, and the fact they've never seen it is very bizarre. But, horror um, movies for them were like universal horror movies, I think. Yes. You know, I think that's totally. what they were like, what they yeah. had in their mind. It's like, as a kid, I saw yeah. Frankenstein. <laughs> that's yeah. it. That's it. Nothing else. Um, but so basically, they just were like, okay, give us two weeks and we'll come back with an idea and, uh, and then let's, we'll get off to the races. And so they actually quit writing for American Graffiti. They stepped away <laughs> from that project. Bold fucking move. Thankfully, a year later, they would come back and, and, and write the final script for it. So it wasn't a total loss. But, um, but they basically, you know, were major film school, you know, uh, as they put it, pretentious film school students um, who wanted to inject their influences into the idea for a horror movie, which obviously we've been saying over and over again, is super fucking dope. And for me, it's like I can relate to that, too. When I was in film school, it's like I totally was like... I was into stalker, you know, and fucking, you know, nostalgia. And like, I wanted to make the stalker nostalgia fucking horror movies, which is kind of like a little bit about what's kind of going on in today's world. <laughs> but it's yeah. like, I, I, I can get down with that idea, you know, to, to take yeah. the art house world cinema and to bring it into this. And so they really did 
go mm-hmm. for that. And one thing that's also really cool, I'll say, is that Homeboy Willard was also really into H.P. Lovecraft. He had a huge fondness right. for H.P. Lovecraft when he was a kid, read all the short stories. So they were kind of tr- intentionally going for a very Lovecraftian mood vibe and then kind of splice that with like an Antonioni, La Ventura yeah. like contemplative and and it, pacing. <laughs> yeah. Right. No, and the thing uh, all I'll say is like the um, the stylistic trappings of a Lovecraft story um, is not there, but it, it it looks and feels like Antonioni. But the the the, the subject at hand is more uh, Lovecraftian. And all I mean is there's no tentacled creatures anywhere in sight. No. Right. You know right. I mean, of it, course. You know. Yeah. So because um, I think yeah. it can bog down sometimes. Uh, there's a Lovecraft like um, shorthand aesthetic. And Cthulhu. that's almost always what you get, but it's very refreshing to see them take that into, I wouldn't say realism, but right. just not fantasticalism. Mm-hmm. You know. Well, one of the big yeah. things that that is very Lovecraftian, you know, like just real quick, and I'll give it to you, Marcus. Like one of the things that is Lovecraftian, though, is like finding letters of somebody who, yeah. you know, has had an encounter with something that's driving them mad. You know, totally. that is very <laughs> Lovecraftian, and that's what they utilize. But they also kind of imbue that with like a French New Wave sort of like uh, unreliable narration. You know, yeah. that's juxtaposing with the imagery. I saw an art gallery and I thought they might know my father. The art dealer was blind. Like kind yeah. of like a pickpocket kind of idea. You know, nice. uh, yeah. you know, that's kind yeah. of like where their head is at. But yeah, Marcus, what were you going to say? I oh, totally agree. I just before we got off George Lucas, I just wanted to drop a oh, couple sorry. tidbits for the audience. Just that, you know, one that, uh, you know, George's first he was an experimental filmmaker in college you know and then his first feature was a sort of experimental ish type film he tried to bring that european with with thx he tried to bring in sort of a european point of view you know artsy movie artsy mindfuck kind of movie um but that these folks kept continued to work with him they worked on indiana jones uh uh, raiders of the lost ark with him howard the duck howard Howard directed they directed howard the duck the first (laughs) comic book movie yeah, my kind of people. Yeah. Wow. yeah, totally. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> and then they also uh, amazing. They are forever tied to the Star Wars, le- uh, you know, uh, legends because supposedly uh, they they were the ones that suggested uh, when George was like, trying to figure out what to do with Empire that they just suggested as a joke. Well, why don't you just have a scene where Darth Vader comes out and says he's Luke's father? Stop. <laughs> Supposedly really? that they said that as a joke and that George was like, wow, oh, that's pretty good actually. You know? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> no shit. And they were yeah. saying Supposedly, it's a joke. I, some, right. that's some accounts say that, you know, so. Um, Darth Vader, dark father. They were just like, yeah. Yeah. All right. Like, how about that, George? That's like a dumb idea you'd have. Like, yeah. Right. <laughs> well, remember we talked about how that wasn't his idea at first in the in the wow. Star Wars episode. So shout out, um, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, anyway, um, dude, more shout outs. Yeah, more shout outs. <laughs> and look, uh, Willard and Gloria seem. I mean, Tom, you 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 actually hung out with the, these two. They they seem like such fucking cool people. Just from the commentary, yeah. they have such a good sense of humor. Yeah. Uh, their re- like reflection back in this is very adorable because they're like, yeah, when yeah. we made it, like we don't even know what the fuck we were, what it means, but yeah. we like we like watching people and reading reviews of people trying to figure it out and then putting their own meanings into it and stuff. So they're very just right. like they seem like super cool people, and they're even telling stories like on the commentary track, like oh yeah, like you know we had this production assistant you know who kept supplying the whole crew with amphetamines as we were shooting so right. her we're name just was on, candy yeah her name was candy <laughs> like for real so they laughed about that they thought, yeah they laughed never, about that i i did Love hang it. out with them uh one night actually weirdly enough it was a screening of uh messiah and they stayed upstairs in the office and i was in the office with them the whole time now this is the funny part is that it was the night that south park premiered their episode where george lucas is no assaulting I swear to God, is assaulting <laughs> Indiana Jones because this Stop. is right when that two twenty th- tens Indiana Jones came out. Yeah. Right. Yep, okay. Yep. So mm-hmm. so that so so they were like, hey, that's on like right now. So we put it on the TV and I'm watching it with those two, <laughs> and they're going crazy. They're bawling because they know George, and they're just like, he's gonna hate this, and it's like, oh my God, that's such a George thing he would say. And it was very special. I did not expect that when I went over there. I was like, I'm going to watch the uh, South Park George Lucas episode with two of his old friends. And they were, like I said, they're very funny. 
amazing. Very down to earth, real ass people. Didn't feel like boomer meets you know Gen yeah. X or you know it was just like they're just people. They're just very cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sad to hear she did pass away like five years ago. But she, you yeah. know, I hate hearing that actually. Like, yeah, you know, the Dibbins is gone. Yeah. But they're they're really he's still around. But they're uh, they're very mm-hmm. dope, very warm, very cool people, and they had a great sense of humor. You know. Yeah. And it was it was a joy. And that's so evident on the commentary and just hearing them tell yeah. all these stories and the fact that you know everyone's on speed making this movie it's just amazing um but it's also like it's also like a story of real sort of run and gun ragtag filmmaking too on a very small budget mm-hmm. and you know they they ran out of money during this production and tried to raise more money uh by showing the the like an unfinished version of the film to the different studios they were like hell no and so and it's kind of a crazy story where a lot of the financiers were you know legal battles with various financiers uh right. and then ultimately they lost control of sort of the final cut and like the ending was not cut with their supervision and then the the score they have no they had no say over the score um, no say over the score all wow. the moon cutaways they had nothing yeah to do with the, the inserts cutaways. yeah the, yeah the inserts yeah. and um yeah. you know what really gets me actually is the title uh because um this is an example for me of one of my favorite movies <laughs> seriously dope but not my favorite title because it feels a little generic and a little confused and sort of mm-hmm. non-representational in a way, I guess. Evil, yeah, yeah. Well, but even the Messiah, like he's the Messiah of evil. It's okay. I don't <laughs> yeah. hate the title. I like it. It, does, it sounds like a <laughs> sketch, no, no. like kids in no, the no, hall no, sketch or something. Yeah, exactly. Like, uh, yeah, the fruits of evil. No, but I'm, more what I'm saying is like, because like this was not their first choice. They weren't like, we're gonna make Messiah of evil. Like, and so I like that they were, rattling, they were rattling off other titles. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of them was like, God, what was it? The Virgin of uh, the uh, uh, Virgin, Blood, of Virgin. Blood? Blood Virgin, Blood Virgin, Blood Virgin. And then it was that's not my favorite either. You know, no. I'm not here to nitpick their titles. I'm just saying yeah. that like the <laughs> one that feels, yeah, right. The one that feels the most right to me is the one they wound up with. I think the shooting title was the Second Coming. Yeah. Which kind of uh, that would be that kind of elevates the see that's what I mean like it kind of elevates the film and it could have been maybe even appreciated in a non grindhouse drive in context maybe mm-hmm. if people didn't get thrown up at the title total side note on the title how about Woody Allen yeah and Annie Hall yep. uh, his the people who did his B roll said hey look at this double feature at a drive in in L A in nineteen seventy six mm-hmm. uh, when he's shooting Annie Hall. Guess what? It's a uh, B-roll of them driving by a drive-in in the scene in the film when Woody Allen's looking at how ugly and gross and stupid and how un-New York Los Angeles is. They cut to a marquee. Messiah yeah. of Evil and uh, shit, I'm forgetting the other movie. Uh, I'll cut to it. Beyond the Door or something. But yeah. anyway, and I was always like, uh, like you know, if you knew Woody, that movie's actually really cool, you fucking prick. And, yeah. um, and also, <laughs> Joy Bang is in it, who is also in your... Um, uh played against sam How about oh that? isn't that wow. weird so this anyway my point favorite. is just the title and then actually the my favorite title is the second sort of producer generated title mm-hmm. it was messiah but also was dead people i know and that I, have you ever cool. seen some my favorite you ever seen some yeah that's cool you ever see some ad art for that just like yeah dead the people. way it's written yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. like starts that's, friday it's dead people that's like 1974 yeah. that's pretty that's pretty hot yeah that is so good the title. And butthead title yeah it's did, awesome did yeah. i read that did people was the sort of appreciation for this film before the dvd like release because i i'd read that it kind of that people didn't that when it was shown on home video maybe it was cropped people didn't appreciate it or something oh figured, it's yeah. heavy pan and scan until uh the digital releases yeah yeah that's it i think i have that yeah Ooh, check it out nice big brutally cut uh big box yeah i was read, reading big somewhere cut else like box <laughs> psychotronic big cut box I didn't look it up, but the Psychotronic Encyclopedia didn't didn't give it you know kind of panned it. Yeah, too. well, well, it's it's it was horribly panned and scanned because the film is shot scope and it looks really Beautiful. gorgeous and it's composed with scope in mind. But then it was brutally panned and scanned, big square and uh, faded print. The colors weren't strong, and so but I still loved it. And actually, I'm such a weirdo that I watch <laughs> the VHS version because it's the one I know the most. And wow. there is a charm to it because it feels like you're flipping channels at three in the morning and TV. And it's like, <laughs> what? You know? Um, but yeah, no, it's, it was hard to really... Ca- it was really like seeing it for the first time when you saw the scope version and the good color. It was like, mm. wow. You know, it's wow. really um, uh, striking. Wow. That's cool. 
Wow. Can we talk for a second about the just the you mentioned the scope? Maybe now's a good time just to mention like the, how it shot in technoscope. And I, you know, it's so cool. It was like a, it's like a perf situation. Yeah. You've heard people talk about two perf, four perf, or whatever in film. And that it was sort of, it was like sort of like the perforation along the edge of the film, right? Okay. Mm. And so this is like, uh, and most like 35, I think is like four perf, you know? Oh, so this God. was like two perf shot with a scope two, lens. So it kind of squished perf, it. So you could, it was actually a cost saving device because you could fit, you could shoot with less film. Oh, but yeah. But then you'd also, it also oh, okay. would be a widescreen, you know, super Amazing. widescreen. Oh, wow. So it was kind of wow. the best of both worlds in that you're getting, you're kind of up leveling your look by giving it that wide, but super wide budge. screen. Yes, wow. but you're on a budget, you're saving wow. more money. And they wow. mentioned that um, American Graffiti is also shot in this format. Oh, oh okay. And that's also this, why this, this movie looks really grainy. 35, though, not 16. It's 35, but it the is, reason yeah. it's grainy is because it's scaled up because it's that, uh, because wow. of that process. But it's, um, but it's, it. it's basically getting two frames per what would that's normally be amazing. one frame on 35. Yeah. Right. So it's wow. pretty cool. That is cool. That's dope. Um, I want to see every film shot that way. Yeah, yeah. two perf, two perf <laughs> only, bro. Yeah. I think um, they mentioned THX. I think is also and um, oh, okay. and right. American Graffiti. Yeah, there you go. Um, well, let's get into the movie itself because there's a lot of fucking crazy set pieces to talk about in this movie. Set piece can, core. Yeah. Set piece core. Let's go a little chronologue uh, here in the beginning, just because there's so much cool stuff to talk about. Okay, very unusual that any movie would have two cold opens, two separate cold <laughs> opens, and two yeah, always separate me. credit sequences. <laughs> <laughs> and right, one so. of these, and one version has this really sappy, like Rod McEwen cover. It's like, what is going on? Really? It's very disorienting. <laughs> like the first five minutes, it's like, are the reels missing? Is this like the, the end of a different film, the third reel? Oh, my God. Because well, it's people. And what I'm saying is like the first few minutes you see characters that are not otherwise seen in the rest of the film. Oh, got you, got you, got you. What? Well, yeah. I mean, this. so the first opening, what are we seeing? We're seeing Walter Hill getting his throat slit is, is the first, you know, yeah. cold open, which is amazing that yeah. they were friends with Walter Hill. That you know, cool. before he was... Uh, you know, famous director, and he's an AD at the time, writer, and he's friends with, uh, you know, Willard and, and, and Gloria. So you see a little cameo of him getting his throat slit. Have no idea what's going on with that. That doesn't really come around again until I think the whole movie comes around. Um, so, uh, but then we get into a little credit sequence, and then it gets into fucking amazing soft focus Dude. shot of this hallway which we learned in the mm. commentary was actually the Technicolor offices, which is amazing. But basically, it. By the way, that's, that looks like a structuralist film. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, not yeah. to get, I'm going to get really art school here with you. It looks like an Ernie Gurr film, Serene <laughs> Velocity, which, Whoa. you know, I used to think like, oh, like what a coincidence. But now I'm like, maybe it's an overt Could homage be. to like a major kind of a Michael Snowish kind of structural Michael film. Michael Snow. Mm. Totally. Yeah. Totally. So it's like, okay, so the movie starts soft focus. We're in an, like fucking ins like we're in an insane asylum, okay? And uh, obviously voiceover. But what happened there? What they did to me? What they're doing now? And it's like it's it's the perfect way. That's the best way. I wish it just kind of opened with that, you know, versus the Walter yeah. Hill thing because it yeah. Anytime you open an insane asylum like that, it's like, okay, it gives you license to do pretty much anything for the whole movie because that's going to be sort of, you know, like the rest of the movie is going to be a flashback that leads us up to that point. It's a POV right, of the right. insane person or we're going to find out what made them go insane, right? Um, so it's just incredible. And then her scream that she delivers. No one will hear you scream! Her performance during that narration in the opening is incredible. I, I love it. Um, and bear with me. Um, <laughs> uh, shout out to any millennial listener who might know this reference that I'm going to make. But um, <laughs> but PewDiePie? basically, but no, no, God damn it, no. But basically, uh, this the same like fucking setup to this goddamn movie the idea of her you know like like disturbing letters trying to you know search for a missing family member or loved one yeah. and then of course it erupts into the walking dead is exactly the setup to the playstation 2 game silent hill 2 so shout out anybody <laughs> okay. uh, i kind of wonder not one silent not hill one, two. two 
Wow. Did like right. were I'm they take your word for that? I don't know. Were the Silent Hill two people <laughs> like Messiah of Evil fans? I don't know. That's just what that I immediately think of. You know, it's it's crazy. So mm-hmm. um nice. yeah, man. Uh but we're getting introduced- to my favorite part. And yeah, I almost wish the movie opened here. <laughs> in the next in the next scene. Sure. Can we should we get into it? Sure, sure. Gas station? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Gas station core. So so gas station core, uh well first we're introduced to the you know, the leading character. Uh Mariana Hill is the actress's name. She plays our Letty, which we which, learn in the You take it. Well, just a total side note on her. It's I just rewatched Godfather Two. And it's very crazy if you're a Messiah of Evil fan and you throw on <laughs> Godfather 2 and suddenly the woman from Messiah of Evil is like dancing with Fredo <laughs> at the <laughs> wedding, you know, because Mariana Hill is in Godfather 2. Wow. It's crazy. Yeah. It's like Marcus was saying, it's, it, it, you know, she's webbed into that network. That scene. Mm-hmm. With Coppola, Lucas, and yeah. the whole thing because uh, it's that Bay Area thing, basically. Right. You know? Yeah, yeah. And so her name is um, her name is um, Arletty, which is a reference to the actress who played the lead character in Marcel Carnet's *Children of Paradise*, <laughs> which should give you all that should tell you everything you need to know. In there, terms there of where, it is. Yeah, where where they're yeah. nerd fucking nerds. Yeah, yeah. nerd alert. Good. You know, that was uh, in my notes. Is what kind of name is Arletty anyway? Yeah, you know, <laughs> not a lot of films. Excuse me, not a lot of gut bucket drive-in movies cite. Children of Paradise. Children of Paradise. <laughs> not yo. a lot of them. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. Crazy, crazy. Not, so anyway, all right. So so then we get into this gas station sequence, guys, and there's a lot to talk about because um, it it is it is amazing, and and um, I'll I'll let you get into it. The only thing I want to say is um, this scene and a couple others that we're going to get to really feel like hardcore proto David Lynch. And, you know, sure. Jack, yeah. Jack Fisk, obviously, is the art director of this movie who'd gone on yeah. to work with David on many, many, many films. Uh, so there's he, an, was, uh, he was probably a year off from starting to help him out with Eraserhead exactly. in L.A. Yeah. Exactly. So there's a he's sort of a legend. I mean, he's done so much. Besides Lynch, you know, uh, Carrie and Phantom of the Paradise. One that jumped out at me, though, is he's listed as production designer on Darktown Strutters. Which That's I can't right. believe. <laughs> One of the great yeah. black exploitation movies. It's kind yeah. of a living comic book. And that art direction is out of <laughs> it's lunch. It's insane. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is out to lunch. It's uh, uh I'm not surprised I was pleasantly surprised and uh, it makes sense that he would be helming really one of the most gloriously demented set designed um black exploitations yeah no jack no, is great and he's uh you know he's married to sissy spacek or i guess still is i don't know and um yeah so uh both of them were poor and crazy and uh he was working on badlands too as well with mm-hmm. her and everything like that uh so he actually it's funny he worked with lynch and he worked with um with uh malik you know uh, and but he also made his own couple movies. Uh, was it Raggedy Man is very weird with his with Sissy, you know. So yeah, Sh- mm. Jack Fisk is involved. How about this? Mm-hmm. How about this? As we're recording right now, uh, just a few hours ago, the New York Times Magazine published a profile of Jack Fisk. What? Yeah. Fuck. <laughs> Today. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. Why? I don't know. I got to read it. But that's the genius like, behind. There- Hollywood's most. Um, I was worried you were going to say that he died. No, I know. I know. Totally. <laughs> Sorry, he's dead. Um, no, yeah, but anyway. Yeah. Um, so the movie feels very proto Lynch. It just mm-hmm. fucking does. And like right when we roll into this gas station, the first thing you see, which is even scarier in the pan and scan version, by the way, might I mm-hmm. add, where you just okay. see the fucking gas station attendant shooting his gun into darkness. And you're like, what is Dude, going on? I know. Do you know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. What yeah. is that? It's all about you the know? gas station scene. Just here's my little thing. So, you know, this was uh, my only origin story is that, um, you know, it was one of the titles you rented on VHS in the 90s, like this weird movie, that weird movie. And I had, you know, eventually you get around to Messiah of Evil. And like I was saying, it was a little bumpy for me at first when those first openings were happening. Yeah. Uh, and I, I liked them. They were interesting and there were some rewards to them, but I was 100% locked in on the gas station. Yeah. The atmosphere, like you said, the style, the, uh, the ominous tone, the dream logic of it. But the star of the show is the actor. He's uh, an albino gentleman. He's got an incredible performance, very stoic. 
he eats mice and he uh it, it listens to wagner no why wa- wa- wagner excuse wagner. me that up. he's <laughs> like uh you like wagner you like wagner oh yeah sure <laughs> and uh, that one, I've said that to friends for years. Like, you like Wagner? Because uh, <laughs> he's listening to Wagner. And what I love, tidbit from the commentary, is um, yes. they just rolled with uh, that actor mispronouncing uh, Wagner's name and just going, that's, Wagner. That's the so. fucking best. Like, we're jumping around, but that's the best where, oh, where he... No, no, well, it's it's the next. Oh, it's scene. later, it's, yeah. But him, later that in the set yeah. piece in that curve. It's later in the movie, but it's but it's but it's amazing how in the commentary when he's just like people, he was saying people kept coming up to him and and were like, "Aren't you going to tell the actor that it's Wagner?" And he's like, "No, it's perfect," you know, right? Like laughing about it. And that's a great. <laughs> that's sensibility. what's up. That's what's up, you know. And it's it's really incredible. Um, anyway, other, love that actor. Other mm-hmm. thing about the gas station scene too. Again. And Tony Oni is firing on all cylinders there too, because you're getting some great framing wide shots of the gas station, and you're getting like the close up of the mobile sign, and mm. um, you're that's just like the easiest no budget way to elevate your movie is just killer exactly. little like with an eye exterior, you know, framed beautiful suitable for beautiful shots. landscape, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, magical, you know, California at night landscape, you know. But it's how, yeah. but it's how they handled it because it could have uh, another filmmaker could have completely ignored that and looked for something mm-hmm. else that was more, yeah. you know, whiz bang about it. But it's a, a and and the atmosphere, all the choices are great. And there's also you know really crazy, maybe the bloodiest murder of the film. Yeah, that happens. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the guy, the guy, you know, the gas station attendant, our, our our surreal boy there, he gets fucking jumped and killed, and then he gets strung up by the the car lift, you know, inside the thing, which is awesome. And then again, all the stylistic flourish of this movie, everything's on all cylinders in this scene, because then not only do you have him getting killed and strung up, like I was saying, but then it's like, oh yeah, let's add the touch of wide shot, all the lights turning off one by one of the gas station as he's dead. So good, and that's like, you know. Yeah. No Fuck music. Yeah. No music. Right? Yeah. No music. That's, that's, that's yeah, amazing. That's movie making. You're only going to get that if you're like on the Antonioni shit, you know? Um, mm-hmm. So that's great. Like A plus scene there. Um, then we get to um, dad's house. Uh, so she's now searching for, you know, where her missing, you know, disturbed father is. And she gets, she winds up in this weird ass house, man, um, which I guess was an Echo Park they, that that they found, which is cool to know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And and she basically walks into this house, and and here we are seeing this incredibly bizarrely production designed. You were alluded to it earlier, man. It's this place yeah. that's covered in murals of basically middle aged gentlemen standing you know, <laughs> in <Yeah>. disarray. <laughs> there's, there's also a nice uh, portrait of Lee Harvey Oswald. Like when you close yeah. the uh, closet curtain, the closet door or something, it's yeah, like Oswald's yeah. face. No, yeah. but I, I, so, okay. Actually, we're talking about Fisk a second ago. I'm glad we mentioned him earlier. Uh, I was always complimenting Fisk because I made an assumption because yeah. of his flourishes in other films and especially in actually Dark Town Strutters. Um, like I assume that he uh, masterminded and did the mural set piece of the father's house. But just found out hearing the commentary that it was Katz's um, friend from college. She uh, is, uh, is an artist, and she did the murals. And she, uh, I think it's that technique where you blow up yeah. uh, uh, photographs. Project um, it, yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah, you project it on the wall, and you paint it. And it was all photographs of, like, the San Fernando Valley, like people waiting at bus stops, in laundromats, oh, uh, you cool. know. Holy shit, beautiful. And all the colors schemes, the you know, um, really talented stuff. That's awesome. And it works with the movie too super well because it's it's not it's not something I really put together until you know it really comes around. We'll get to other scenes, of course, is like you know we're going to get to the Ralph scene here in a minute. But you really yeah. see like you know all of these zombified ghoul people who are obviously wearing civilian clothes and you know mm-hmm. things like that. And I think it's supposed it's supposed to be representative of the what whatever the zombies are in this movie, right? right? The sort of right. Townie and you people. don't really pick up on that to the end. I think that's one of the great strengths of this movie is you don't really know where it's going. You're, you're deep in the movie before you yeah. kind of even get an inkling where it might be going. 
Yeah, totally, hundred percent. So yeah, uh, her name was uh, Joan Joan Mosin, I guess, was the person who did all the paintings. She was Gloria's college roommate at UCLA. Great, uh, incredible. Right. Um, they also San Fernando Valley. I feel like I feel like comes out a lot on our show as well too. And um, <laughs> just the last episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, last American and, Virgin, and or two episodes ago. Yeah, and they 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 wanted to invoke this idea of ghouls invading the San Fernando Valley into this right. uh, in terms of what their um, interpretation right. or what the direction was for the murals, um, and, you know, for what her father is supposed to be painting with these murals. And I guess they yeah. sort of, uh, the influence for that was a Norman Mailer quote. Um, at the time, I guess Norman Mailer at the time had said, if there was ever a catastrophe that destroyed the world, it would be rebuilt like the San Fernando Valley. <laughs> so right. it would so look they, like the San yeah, Fernando Valley. So they so they took that as a cue, I guess, for how they approached right. all of this. Um, right. So it's super cool. You get to see his his pad, man. It's 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 insane. Like you're seeing these set pieces where there's a swinging bed hanging by a chain. There's even like uh, like sculptures that are also fit. You know, like kind of in perspective with the murals like there's a dog yeah. statue that's supposed to be you know that's supposed to go with uh, the mural integrated kind of integrated yeah, yeah exactly i don't know the term for that uh but it's like very unusual places for these murals like you'll see that th there's that one scene where you know one of the women is bathing in the bathtub and then there's like all the people like waiting like they're a sad jury members or something yeah. it's like shit that's incredible dude so that's, that's like half the movie for me is yeah uh, the yeah. moral set piece. And whenever she's in there too, she's like reading her father's book. So there's this like voice or his like diary or whatever. So there's like this voiceover, which reminded me of like Alphaville or something when you've got this like yep. deep philosophical yeah. like voiceover yeah. that's running through. So is that more of like that Godard influence coming through? Well, we, totally. we they do they do overtly uh reference Godard visually in later in the film, you know. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't oh, be surprised big. if they were doing some Alphaville there. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Um, another set piece that's great. Again, I hate to keep saying it. Super David Lynch before David Lynch is the art <laughs> gallery sequence where the, where she goes mm -hmm. to track down her father. Yes. It's like the local art Definitely. gallery, <laughs> and it feels like something out of Fire Walk with me. It really does. Like the scene yeah. with the the weird. Like of course the idea. It's a very Lynch humor to have a blind art dealer. Of course, right? yes. Uh -huh. mm. Ha ha. But she goes like it, we're introduced to her by f she feels up the face of the lead character. Very weird. Like what the fuck's going the on? The pacing there feels Lynchian too. You know yeah. how totally. slow thing, slowly things are unraveling. Totally. And can, then, can I just say right around this part of the film too is my favorite shot of the film. Uh, that weird old character actor Elijah Cook Jr. Yeah. While I'm winding up in this film, he's in like the Maltese Falcon for Christ's sake. And right. there's this great shot that looks so good in the widescreen version of him just uh, sitting next to a uh, motel television set. Yeah. And that that actually for me evokes like Dan Klaus, like his more yeah. his later kind of drama comics, you know. Um, sure. Sure. And then Lynch too, you know, and it's yeah. all interrelated, and, and uh, it's on par with all that stuff. It yeah, is. and that his character that he's playing reminded me of, um, like he's that sort of Renfield, John the Baptist kind of character who precedes the monster, and like mm -hmm. he's the drunk who's seen the horrors and explaining sure. it. We saw the same thing in Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That's right, yeah. it's like that trope of like, you yeah, know, yeah. They listen to I, an old man. Right, yeah. <laughs> so that harkens back to the like, you know, the traditions of the horror genre. That's one moment totally. that kind of does. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, I, when like anytime I see him, I, I always think of the killing, you know, Stanley Kubrick's yeah. the killing. Like mm -hmm. he's right. his face in that, especially towards the end, is incredible. Um, anyway, yeah, so we're introduced to him in this crazy motel room, but then we're like introduced to these this very weird idea for a character, like this sort of swinging bachelor who's got a <laughs> amazing suit and, it. and two chicks. He, it's you like know? he walked out of like a Playboy magazine cigarette ad. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Right, you know. Totally. Yes. Quick totally. shout out. That's yeah. Michael Greer. Yep. Who was uh, an, he was one of those rare things. He was an out gay uh, actor. Yeah. And he played gay characters exclusively. Wow. And the exception is this film where he plays you know straight swinging guy with two happening birds you know on his arm. Uh, but otherwise, you know, he was in uh, Fortune of Men's Eye, Fortune of Men's Eyes, um, The Gay Deceivers. He's great in uh, uh, Magic Garden of Stanley's Sweetheart. That's one of my favorites. Wow. So uh, Michael Greer oh, is yeah. a very surprising and very uh, nice uh, presence in the film. Um, mm -hmm. And he, I think he does a nice job in uh, his performance. 
<coughs> excuse me. Yeah, so we're all so so we meet them. Very weird dynamic. You know, you got him with the with his two chicks, you know, essentially. And then they all decide to go back to dad's house, the main character's dad's house, and they're hanging there. Very weird because they're all just kind of very cold and quaaluded mm-hmm. out. Right. Of, it seems like know. they might be malevolent forces at first. Like, it seems like they might be the yeah. bad guys, you know. Sure. Yeah. And the next thing you know, they're showing up at your dad's house and you're inviting them to stay over. Right. You know, and they yeah. feel like later era, like Warhol factory people. <laughs> like, it's more cynical and cold and like callous and is. less like funky. Like 1971 Warhol, like after he got shot, you know, like yeah. the whole scene. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but do you know what I mean? Like it does also feel very quaaluded out, that that set piece where they're hanging oh, yeah. out and they're eating food oh, yeah. slowly and like not I, really I love when that song drops, you know, there's that mm. like kind of mellow song that drops like they put it on the record player. I don't even know what it is, but it just it has yeah. a great vibe, and I feel so relieved that some music plays, you know, in that yeah, moment. Yeah, to break the and tension. It sounds great. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. no, no, totally, hundred percent. Um, yeah, so just very weird, just off kilter vibes. Um, like, yeah, it kind of feels like you know that that repeating sound of a record ending, like, would fit in that whole <laughs> yeah. world <laughs> for some reason. Sure. I don't know why. Um, but so anyway, um, that then gets us to you know the the do you like wagner scene where she yeah does. sorry she basically I, for some reason <laughs> all I, good. I associate i, I always all good. start in my head that he opens the film at the gas yeah. station but yes no, no but, wagner guy yeah you know, but it gives her uh the brunette girl a ride yeah but that's also super quaaludes too because Dude. it's like because 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 there is there is a hundred or thousand red flags of why she shouldn't get in that car yeah. and 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 do any of that you know you start but running i know away I know, from i know but yeah. she's so numb like to everything to before yeah. she gets in the car well, people's and uh, motives are, are a little weird like uh as pointed out in that commentary there the a gas station guy sees like two dead bodies in the back of the of uh, wagner guy's truck you know and is yeah. like okay yeah i know i know what happy trails yeah, yeah, I know. That's kind of the nightmarish dream quality, I guess. Yeah, it doesn't feel exactly. like it plays by um, exactly. normal real world rules. So she gets in the car because it's another, this is just another plane of existence where they all these people are occupying, you know? Mm-hmm. And I love it. Do you I like Wagner. It. I love it. And so then, <laughs> and then he, he talks, bites the head off of Well, mouse. he eats a rat. I eat them. That's what I do with them. Right. Yeah, yeah, holy yeah. shit! And man. she's not sufficient. I mean, she's grossed out by it, but not enough. But not enough. You know? <laughs> no, no. In any other horror movie, that yeah. would be what like is- the big scene that everyone remembers, and but it's played so numb that yeah. it's like just another day in Messiah of Evil Land. Go ahead. Right. Like he might as well have offered her like a peanut butter and yeah. pickle sandwich or something. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Like right, her reaction's right. like, No Ew. thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Yeah, exactly. It's a little um, under, underbaked her uh, response to that insanity and let's him and saying Wagner. Yeah. Um, now she's going to the supermarket. That's oh, her dude. plan here. She's getting a ride from the Wagner guy. Dude. So we're getting to the dude. one of the all-time set pieces of horror filmmaking. Dude, yeah, and if I can lay the groundwork for you here, man, like those scenes leading up to the Ralphs where she's just walking the empty streets of wherever that is in the valley, you know, or Burbank or something, mm-hmm. where it's she's like just Burbank. walking, and it's all the all, all the lights from the different, you know, um, you know, stores and businesses or whatever. Amazing. And there's always like lots of mannequins on display. Yeah. Oh, that so feels like, it feels like American Antonioni for sure. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. and and it's streets with no one. Except it. people huddled in like alleyways who like stop talking and look at you when they when you happen upon them. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. It happens. Well, it happens to the brunette girl and it happens to the Michael Gear character later. Yeah, both equally some of my favorite stuff ever. Unsettling, unpo- unpopulated world. It is a little carnival of souls. It is. It is. Uh, but it's its own thing too. It is. Know? It is. It is. Yeah. So then. So then we get into the supermarket scene. Incredible the way it's shot, Dude. the way it looks. It's so oh. 1971 and amazing. Um, and, you know, another detail learned by the commentary, but it's worth mentioning, yeah. is the idea of how when they put out the casting call 
for all the ghouls and the zombies and the extras they needed, they kept getting unemployed aerospace workers <laughs> showing up, right. which is incredible because right. I guess there was some sort of like crisis in the aerospace industry happening like, nearby. There's probably J- big uh, layoffs in the there, military right? budget. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> It was because well, my uh, my uncle worked in that in that he lived in Orange County. No and shit. And my uncle worked in that in that field, you know, and he was <laughs> he could have been there. Off work. Oh right, Boeing's yeah. out in Orange County, and I think JPL is out in Jet Propulsion Labs out. In yeah, Val. but no, it's that yeah. Boeing yeah. kind of building mm-hmm. airplanes kind yeah. of industry. So I guess there was a yeah. It, oh, I, I think the economy was a little soft generally yeah. then. So yeah, no, totally. Okay, okay. And, so yeah, and, that's that's the people eating the raw meat. Yeah. You know, hunched over like the uh, in the meat section. Yeah. You know what's? Can I just say one thing? The, the, the thing is, usually horror movie scenes are dimly lit, shadows, ooh, you know. But this mm-hmm. is flat, huge flood of fluorescent light because it's yeah. a supermarket. Love yeah. That to me mm-hmm. is the master stroke. Yep. That's I agree. I, I totally yeah. agree. Go ahead. Every supermarket mo- shot in a movie is probably my favorite. No, but the horror the of the circumstance. <laughs> oh, for you know, sure. Like she's being eaten alive in like aisle three, and it's like bright lights. Yeah. Well, it's an empty. Stuff. It's an empty supermarket when she's walking around looking for people to, oh, you so know. Good. And that's <laughs> kind of well, one of the thing about the. Uh, oh, sorry, real quick. Uh, th- that that's kind of proto Dawn of the Dead too, a little bit. You know, like yes, yeah. I mean, it really <laughs> is. Absolutely. You know, like in in a lot Just, of ways, yeah. One thing that, that I always found uh, very special is the disconcerting way it feels like that scene is falling apart in terms of editing. It is. Because yeah. it's like very, <laughs> yeah. like when she's on the ground and they're like tearing her into pieces in aisle three, it's like it, it, the cuts are quicker than I think they intended because like there's like missing footage. And that's even is, in yeah. like the restored digital versions. I thought that would be uh, changed, uh, you know, from the VHS one I'm used to. Right. But it's just like it makes it feel very... Um, like uh, out of control. You guys don't talking about yeah, like the yeah. very end, the micro edits where mm-hmm. you can see like almost like splice tape. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. I get well, shout out to the two editors, a couple editors that were on this project, right? One's Billy Weber, and he did a lot of like Malick movies and like Top Crazy. Gun and stuff like that. You know what? And then the other guy, uh, oh. yeah, he did he did Badlands, Days of Heaven, Beverly Hills Cop, Top Gun. Wow. Like and then so um, there's another guy, Morgan Fisher. Who was oh, a yeah. professor at, at you know Cal Arts and also like an experimental filmmaker, who made you know these cool like experimental film. Uh, it'd be like a a bunch of film cells that are stills, and he's talking mm-hmm. about his like uh, his career as a filmmaker and stuff. So he also was involved in this movie. I don't know who did which parts, but right, you got two right. kind of great editors working. That on this guy film. is the um, the guy you just mentioned. The experimental filmmaker is the guy in the art gallery with the blind. That's right. Yeah, the blind. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's, the art. That's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's a he's a, he was a real wild character. He did a lot of found footage stuff too. Cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, he made whole films out of short ends of. Uh, you know, edits uh, that are yeah. lying on the editing floor and stuff like that, and just very like cool. jumbled them together. So yeah, there's a as, as you can see, there's a very huge force that is not normal for a horror movie to be, uh, you know, under mm-hmm. the hood with this film. And there, Morgan Fisher is a perfect example. He would otherwise not have anything to do with any horror. Films, so many you know? people <laughs> touch this movie, which is so crazy. Yeah. Like not only yeah. just the UCLA Lucas everything world. But then, like, just the fact that Annie Hall touches this movie, it's just, it's got <laughs> so that. many weird tendrils. Um, yeah. Real quick, so I think we should kind of just get into the movie theater scene, which is kind of the other great big yeah. set piece that comes yeah. later on in this uh, film. Even better than the last one. Yeah. <laughs> I know. And <Really>? another, <laughs> another person that touches this movie unexpectedly, who's also starring in this film, probably doesn't even know it, is Sammy Davis Jr. Right. <laughs> you know? Would you be surprised? <laughs> I'll be brief, but would you be surprised that I know what that film is that's playing? <laughs> I have it. I've seen it. It's very weird. Seriously. I mean, I, I won't go too into it, but it's called Gone with the West. It was virtually unreleased. It was like sort of made in '68. James Conn's also in it, um, wow. and uh, and yeah, it's Sammy Davis Jr. And it's like a spoof of a western, and it doesn't make any sense. And it ends with like a break of the fourth wall. That's almost like a Godard move, where wow. they just say like, "Hey, this movie's kind of boring. Let's go." And like the actors just walk <laughs> off the set, <laughs> the camera. I swear to God, it's a very weird film. But for years, I thought that that was not a real film because it was so strange. But Finding out that it was a real film makes it even stranger because it is a strange film. And what I've heard is that they were cutting 
originally when they were prepping the edit of the film uh they were doing what's that uh, like a musical bandwagon uh from like the 50s and so it would have this more um ironic music you know like like strike up the band kind of music when the the <laughs> gathering storm of the people are coming but now it's just this weird violent anonymous western and the only reason that western's there is because the producers who did take control of the film and kind of away from the uh, the directors um they they also h handled Messiah of Evil and they handled Gone with the West. So they just went like, oh, we'll throw, you know, it's Steve, you know the same name as Junior Weston in there. So it's, it's so, so weird how long it lives in that movie. Like you, you will stay watching Gone with the West for a lot I longer know. than. No, I know. Expect. And also, yeah. you know, it seems like, oh, they're cutting it weird. Like, why is there a 20 minute fight of just people fighting and sound effects? But that is the film. For like 20 <laughs> minutes, people are just fighting and yelling at each other and drinking beer. Like the film doesn't really have a plot. I swear it's strange. It might be on YouTube, guys. Gone with the West. Okay. Incredible, love it, but yeah, I mean this this set piece in general. As we're watching, um, you know, one of the women is that um, what's her name? That's Joy uh, Bang, motherfucker. That's right, Joy Bang. Wow, what a name! Greatest um, name ever. Real name. Yeah, her Joy. Name, her real name's Joy, and she married a guy named Bang. <laughs> yeah, it's insane. Joy Bang. So she's in the movie theater that gets slowly populated by zombified. Huge. unemployed aerospace workers who um know. who with, it's with, great with eyes yeah which is incredible like that adds to it like the fact that they got like I seriously know. like aging like you know i don't know like nasa people or whatever they are like no n not just that but their wives the, the yeah, women freak too. me out it'd yeah. be like that the director's too. mom and grandma and stuff like that oh, oh. Totally. they called in like every favor they could uh, like populate influenced the by the birds you know, uh, you'd think it feels like it is, but it was clearly influenced by the birds. Oh, like the birds yeah. filling out on like every time you cut back, there's more yeah. birds. That right. shot of Amazing. the birds on the um, and, the and play, our protagonist is unknowing. At, you know, at first, yeah, but yes. we know right, there's right. a spectator that there's a gathering yeah, yeah. storm behind her. Good call. That's it's good. so good. And Gone with the West is playing in the background. <laughs> Holy <laughs> shit! <laughs> Gone with the West. Gone One fucking hour for. and gone with the West. Yeah, I think a All moment's right. on the horizon. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Got a moment's rising. Um. All right. So, uh, where are we? I don't know. Should we? Well, we well just the, 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 the scene with the. Uh, are we good on the theater? I mean, I mean we're good. Uh, yeah, we're good. It's amazing. We should talk about the ending because the ending's insane too. Dude, the ending. Yeah. Um. You know, where we're just seeing fucking ghouls crash through the fucking glass ceiling. Know. You know, it's, it's almost incredible. like an Asian horror film. It is. In a way. You know? Totally, yeah. Like Brothers. action packed zombie attacking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, totally. But my thing is the dad returns. Yeah, and he's like pouring the paint on his face, and he stares at her with like blue paint dripping, and that's a horrifying, striking <laughs> image, like blue and red, and it was influenced by Godard's. Um, Piero what, what is it? Uh, uh, Piero. Piero. Piero Lefou. Lefou. Piero, Piero Lefou. Lefou. Yeah. yeah. Lefou. 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 Right. Crazy. Yeah, no, that's uh <laughs> and you know I was thinking that's that was an old man actor. Uh and he was like, What are we doing today? Yeah. I just pour paint all over my fucking head. Like, right. Let's go, man. So Side note, knows? that guy is in Twin Peaks. He's a judge yeah, in like, right, one of the episodes right. of Twin Peaks. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. yeah, wow, crazy. Another Lynch connection for crying out loud. Um, there you go. But uh <laughs> another node for this film. I know. Yeah. So as we alluded to earlier in our conversation, you know, there were they, they ran out of money and the financiers basically, you know, got the film back from they were still working on the film, but they had smuggled the like the work print out of Technicolor and were editing it and getting it to yeah. where they wanted it to be. But ultimately, once the financiers legal battle had resolved, they resumed control of the film again and sort of re not recut it, but finished editing it without their influence. So the ending of the film was supposed to be much more elaborate. And the, it, it actually required a lot more stuff that they needed to film. Um, and uh, one of the things was kind of the big explanation <laughs> for what's, yeah. you know, what the hell's going on? For what, you know? for what was written on the back of the Blu-ray. Right? Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The Messiah part of the title, yeah. Yeah, I know, <laughs> right. which, is, which is incredible. Um, but like um, I, in the commentary, they sort of allude to what it was supposed to be. There's a scene where he's supposed to put his hand on her face and 
uh, uh, like you know, you know, the dad is supposed to put his hand in her face and burn this scar into you know this handprint on her, and um, yeah. you see it on her face, but you don't see right. it actually happen. The scene on the beach at the end was supposed to have three hundred extras. They were going to pull all the yeah. stops out, and then, uh, you know, for that. Instead, there were like five people. Yeah, I know so, exactly. But they, quite I think the they made up for it by making them swim under the pier, which is one of the like scariest, most unsettling thoughts I can think uh, of. Being bashed there is, it does end with that great barnacles. shot. Uh, the zoom out of her in the in the, in the ocean, yeah, where it's yeah. just her figure in the water, and it's just zooming out, and it feels mm-hmm. like there's a vastness that she's in. Yeah. yeah, another nice touch. And then it takes a it it takes a, a page from uh, from Babylon. Shout out to the uh, archives, um, where it re <laughs> it re it replays. Where is he going with this one? <laughs> Elephant where, where, diarrhea or something? Where, no, no, no. It it, no. it it replays the hits of that. that that uh, you've yeah, seen right. in Which the film. Confirmed yeah. in, in the commentary, once again, great commentary. Great That's commentary. totally the producers. Like, of course. They wouldn't yeah. have done that, that wrap yeah. up kind of thing. You know? Or it shows Although the it's best appreciated. things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is cool because, you know, if, if this is an yeah. experimental art house film anyway, who gives a fuck? It's cool. You know, to see kind of a That's montage. the Annie Hall the... ending, right? Yeah. That's right. Right. <laughs> right. Nick, That's the nickname for <laughs> yeah. wrapping it up right. in quick succession. Which is, yeah. wow, yeah, how uh, ironic and weird it's that getting is. weirder here whoa <laughs> um but it's cool it, it is welcome you know um, as you said yeah. but so you know th- this movie didn't make much of an impression upon its release i don't think it because it, it you know came out under a million different titles um i think one of the titles was return to the living dead wasn't it not yes and, and then uh, romero's people sued because it was like <laughs> seven months before dawn of the dead's release yeah it was like Cease and desist, you know. Yeah, and, and that's yeah. the thing. The directors they had nothing to do with it. Yeah, you nothing know, to do with that. Gloria. So this was they, like they probably forgot the, about the movie. You know, they were yeah. working on the Howard the Duck script then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it just got it just got uh, way out of hand. And then the movie did eventually come out on VHS in the eighties, and then um, it wasn't really until DVD. Uh, that's when I first heard about it. When it hit on DVD. Yeah. It was on Code Red DVD, and I was all right. about the Code Red releases. You know, the Visitor sure. was, yeah, yeah. you know, that, uh, the fucking Redeemer. Those guys were smoking some yeah. weird shit over there. So I was all about yeah. whatever they were putting out, and this they was one taste. of them. They did. And watching this was like, holy shit, you know? So, yeah, um, yeah shout out, man. Fucking Messiah of Evil. And it's, 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 you know, it's been rediscovered. It's actually, I don't care, but it's been kind of, it's like a hipster title. It's like a how to kind of thing. Like, okay, people aren't really trafficking in all this insane garbage. Are like, yeah, I'm a side of evil's cool. You know, like, <laughs> uh, it's cool. But I, but I like that, and it does make sense that because um, this it's bursting at the seams with style. Yep. You know, it's it's mm-hmm. singular, and it's uh, cool. those set pieces are unforgettable. The film, it's filmmaking is on fire. It is. You know. It is. And we should all. I, I just learned this too. Insane. It's mm-hmm. actually playing screening. This month what? at the Roxy here in New York what? City. So if you want to see it on the big screen, I think it might even be oh, for film. Shit. I'm not sure, but look it up. It's playing this wow. month at the Roxy. I'll put a link to that in the description too, if you want to see. Wow, it on maybe the big even screen. 35. Oh, shit. Uh, who knows? Because yeah, the colors are supposed to be really saturated in the print. Like even the the releases that yeah. are out there didn't do like a really proper like color right, right, rebalance right. and stuff. So. Right. Right. I always love that shitty VHS version. Hey, I gotta say, I'm not cheating too much, but I just gotta say the reason Jack Fisk is in the uh, New York Times, that's what it was, right? Is because yeah. he's the production designer on Killers of the Flower Moon. Oh, okay. Which, oh, okay. Of course, we're really excited season. about seeing here. Oh, nice. So, yeah, I gotta check all right, everybody, that was one fucking hour on Messiah Great of movie. Evil, your first installment of one fucking Toba. Um, thank you so much for joining us for that, and we also um, appreciate you so much. A couple of things next week. Y'all is going to be very exciting because we have our next installment is going to be one fucking hour on guys, The Shining. We're gonna go. <laughs> Never. Maybe you've heard of it. <laughs> oh, I have. Oh, oh, The Shining. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So wow. we're gonna be getting into The Shining. Our take on The Shining. Uh, um, special guest Ramy Bennett is gonna be back on the show. Oh, sounds great. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thank God. I don't have to rewatch that one. No, no, no. <laughs> right. Holy right. Shit. <laughs> Right, it's, it's twenty minutes exciting. on the bear costume. I think. <laughs> Let's go. But, but again, well, hold on. Let's clarify. This sure. is our take on the film. Mm-hmm. We are not. I'm not going to say it. We're not. We don't have a certain <laughs> mental stream 
You know, our stream right. is maybe yeah, kind of a different take than what The Shining has been getting lately. Yeah. We're free, right. loose, and fancy free here. I have yeah. no <laughs> theories. I don't care. We didn't theorize. We didn't talk about theories of Messiah of Evil, for Christ's sake. We're just going to say, that looked cool. What the hell? That was creepy. Did you mm -hmm. ever notice? We're very, this is this podcast. Did you ever notice when it's like, uh, and it goes like, uh, and like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 hey, doc, ice, you know, how about some ice cream? I want to talk about, hey, doc, how about some ice cream for like a half an hour? Sure. You know what I mean? Let's go. Yeah. I'm very excited. I don't want to I'm... talk about room 237. I don't care. No, I can't believe right, you yeah. said those That's words on this show. All right. So um, next week, one fucking hour in The Shining. It's going to be a big deal. We're going to, we're very excited about it. Ramey's fired up. I'm fired up. That's fun. It's, it's be great. so good. I mean, it's holy shit. Wendy Shining. Carlos. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yep. Uh, week after that, we're going to be getting into little, little, little switcheroo of the schedule to accommodate um, our friend who's going to join us at the end of the month. But the week after next is going to be on reboot walkout. Uh, <laughs> reboot walkout. That's right. Uh, the films that uh inspire uh, like a serious consideration of walking out like i <laughs> life is a little short and i don't need to watch the rest of leatherface the prequel <laughs> you know like I, I i could leave i could leave right yeah, now yeah. so reboot or reboot walk out so yeah yes all the worst of the last 20 years approximately of um dusting horror. off horror franchises uh. and putting their spin on it uh, or, or more jacking it up and modernizing it, you know? Yeah. So it's not yeah. our favorite uh, horror reboots. No. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> right. Can it you imagine? Our, our least favorite. <laughs> uh, no. I can't even joke about that. I can't. I can't. I can't. Yeah. So it is, it is all of the horror movie reboots that we fucking hate. Um, and we're going to get deep into that. I don't even know. Hour is not enough time for that subject, but we're going to try. So be um, selective. You know, that'll be week after next, and then the last week to cap it all off, we're going to have special guest, first time on the show. Very excited about this. All the way from New Zealand, motherfucker, yeah. is going to be um, our good friend Ant Timpson is going to be joining us to uh, get in a cage match with you, Tom, to talk one fucking hour <laughs> on Last House. <laughs> On Dead End Street, very oh. excited because you both have, uh, you know, had some, you know, you both are experts on this film, and it's and it's it's a, I mean, it's it's a wild singular <laughs> film that you've been chopping at the bit, I know, to talk about in this program. Yeah, it's 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 a special one. It's it's uh it's singular. I mean, the original the original film was like two and a half hours long, and it was called The Cuckoo Clocks of Hell. Yeah. And can I just say, <laughs> just in relating to this tonight's episode. Um, this was made uh, uh, as a film called The Cuckoo Clocks from Hell, <laughs> yeah, which is yeah. quoting Vonnegut. Mm. So actually, oh, yeah. just to give you guys a teaser, this is its own demented sort of proto-metal version of Art House meets Grindhouse. It, re yeah. it really is. Yeah. Yeah. Because this guy had a lot more in his mind than just cranking out blood and guts for the sure. drive-in. Totally. So it's, an, it's another example. And it's around the yeah. same time. Different yeah. place, yeah. Uh, and yeah, yeah. And, and, and yeah, like, but it's all about like, um, it's like it's it's a proto metal movie, uh, almost more than anything else for me. Last House of Dead End Street. I'm you guys know so what I mean? excited. I, I do, yeah. and I'm very excited. I've 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 definitely heard you know like the the backstory in this film from you, and it, it's it's fucking amazing. Everybody, get ready f to go to uh, <laughs> Last House on Dead End Street school. It's gonna be it's yeah. gonna be great. Um, That's gonna be a great episode. I mean, I may not say anything the entire episode <laughs> and just listen to you guys. Yeah, I don't that. know. I mean, we'll see. I might just listen to Ant because I no, feel no, no. that he's on another level. Uh, you know, like I think he's like, didn't he like talk to Roger Watkins, the director, or something? Yeah, like? yeah. Was yeah. in correspondence or something? Like I that. guess so. so I, I can't wait either. Yeah. I might even show up. Sounds yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's uh, the rest of the schedule. Of course, we're also going to do some bonus episodes as well on the Patreon. Good time to shout that out. Patreon.com slash one fucking hour is the best way to support the show. Um, if you want to get access to all of our audio commentary tracks, feature length that we've done and the bonus episodes, as I said, um, 
Uh, and, and uh, of course, you get 24 hour early access to every single episode, including the ones from one fucking Tober. And uh, if you like what we do and you want to support the channel, it's the best way to do so. Uh, five, just five bucks a month. Patreon.com slash one fucking hour or scroll to the bottom of this video. Click join and become a fucking moment. And you get the same for the same price point, same perk, same bullshit. So we appreciate that very much. And check out these boys uh, on Tuesday, October 10th at the uh, okay. Philosophical Research Society. Um, they're yes, doing... we're at the Philosophical Research Society, and there won't be any philosophy, and there won't be any research, and there ain't no society. It's just <laughs> us uh, doing a lot of crazy bullshit. So check it out. Yeah, link in the description um for that if you want tickets and uh, time and more information on the events that tom and marcus are doing for the rest of the month of october so uh, um totally yeah um all right everybody well i think that is all we got for you tonight uh looking forward to the rest of the month and uh but of course we can't leave you um without the uh the uh, you know what we should do at the moments what? We should set it up so it sounds like a motor that's starting. Okay. Like someone's starting okay. a, a speedboat. Like, mo, 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 <laughs> mo, <laughs> You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure. There it okay. is. All right. That's very so. Beck, 1994. Or yeah. uh, that's cool. Wake we should and, get a picture Wake and Fright, right? Oh, Wake yeah. and Fright. That's okay. a killer photo. There I it love is. that. <laughs> screenshot, everybody. Almost screenshot. Sigh of evilish. Yeah, okay. screenshot. Coast All right, everybody. Uh, we'll give it to you one more time. It's time for your ma 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 these two women. I mean, it was the kind of theater where you would go to rest when you were shopping. You know, those they were these big old theaters, and they were playing a lot of genre films. And I, I came on the screen, and I was pale, and my voice was shaking because I was nervous. And this woman turned to her friend and said, "He gives me the creeps." Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. It's a good scream. It's a good scream. That was wicked, man.